connections that our congregations uh, join together um, to, uh, to, to engage with Pastor Harris and I as we looked at the issue of slavery um, and looked at the uh, opening chapters of the book of Exodus and studied together. And it was a remarkable experience and people wanted to continue. And so we decided we would show the film Shared Legacies and then um, engage in a conversation. And so that's where we are tonight. And uh, we are very, very excited to welcome our good friend, Jonathan Eig. Um, I should mention that Ken Burns calls Jonathan Eig a master storyteller. Joyce Carol Oates calls his book, Ali, A Life, an epic of a biography. Jonathan is um, a well-known author. He has written a number of books. He is a former writer for the Wall Street Journal. And uh, just yesterday, his book, Luckiest Man, The Life and Death of Lou Gehrig, uh, became a national focus as um, the nation paused to reflect on the important work of ALS and um, the great example of Lou Gehrig. Um, he is uh, working with Burns and Florentine Films on a Muhammad Ali documentary. And his book that he is presently working on is a biography of Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And so welcome Jonathan. And I should also mention that he's a member of Anchi Emmett and um, a partner in a podcast that we do together. And Pastor Chris Harris who needs no um, introduction to this congregation is the founder of Bright Star Church Community Outreach. And um, he also has developed the Turn Center, which is the urban resilience network based on, as we were talking about, the Israeli model of Natal in Tel Aviv. And Turn endeavors to focus on five core competencies, counseling, parenting, mentoring, mentorship, workforce development, and advocacy. And it has been my great honor and pleasure in life to partner with um, Pastor Harris. And we are especially excited to welcome Susanna Heschel. Um, Dr. Heschel is the chair of the Jewish Studies Program at Dartmouth, the Eli M. Black Distinguished Professor of Jewish Studies. Her scholarship focuses on Jewish and Protestant thought during the 19th and 20th century, including the history of biblical scholarship Jewish scholarship on Islam, the history of anti-Semitism. She has a numerous, uh, numerous publications and many book awards. Um, and she's received four honorary doctorates from universities in the United States, Canada, and Germany. Currently, she is a Guggenheim Fellow and writing a book on the history of European Jewish scholarship on Islam. And in 2015, Susanna was elected a member of the American Society for the study of religion. Thank you for joining us, Susanna. We are very honored by your presence this evening. And I want to acknowledge the multi-year effort at deepening the relationship between the Jewish community and the African-American community that we have been engaged with with Bright Star and Anchi Emmett. And <clears throat> we have endeavored over these 10 years to hear each other, to understand each other's community and to the best of our ability to feel each other's pain as well. And we look forward to many more of these gatherings in the future. What I didn't mention about uh, Susanna's um, illustrious uh, uh, CV is that she is also part of a remarkable line of Hasidic Rebbe's. We um, certainly all know of um, her beloved father, Abraham Joshua Heschel. But I was hoping, Susanna, if you would start with a story that I've heard you tell before um, that's important to me. I've used it many times about the Apter Rebbe, who um, had a remarkable heart which gave him a remarkable ability to pray. And so as we begin, I was wondering if you would share that story. I'm happy to do that. Thank you, Rabbi Siegel. Uh, and it's great to be with all, all three of you uh, this evening and to have this discussion of shared legacies. I, I, uh, so 
my father used to tell this story often, and he actually has allusions to it in some of his writings. The person that my father was named for was a Rebbe named Abra Avram Yeshua Heschel, Abraham Joshua Heschel. And he was, um, he lived in a couple of different places, but he was invited to come to Ukraine to the little village of Mezhbish, which is where Hasidism originated, a pietistic revival movement that started in the late 18th century. And while he was there, he was a very charismatic figure. And he died, by the way, in 1825, just to give you a time frame. He was very charismatic. And there were some Hasidic Rebbe's who wrote great books, very sophisticated, theoretical, abstract. He was the kind of person who just was there for other people, created community. And he was a very special human being. And one of the stories that's told to illustrate him is that people would come every day and they would sit with him and they would pour out their troubles, a sick child, someone who didn't have a job, poverty, what to do. And one day his assistant asked him, all of these people come and they ask you to pray for them for a particular problem, but how do you remember them all? And his answer was, when someone comes to me and they tell me all of their sorrows, they pour it out and I open my heart to them and their sorrows make a scar inside my heart. And when I go to pray, I open my heart to God and I say, look at all these scars. And I think the story is important because, you know, I think what does it mean to have the opportunity to talk to someone who listens in that way? Who really listens, a feeling that I would have that I know that my problem is going in their heart. I did have that feeling with my father. And I think it's also a question of what does it take for us to become that kind of a person, to have that kind of heart and to listen in that way. And I know we talk a lot these days about witnessing and about acknowledgement and so forth, and that's all very important. But I think that really that's the heart of what it is to be a religious person, to, to listen the way he listened and to pray the way he prayed. That is what religion brings. That's what piety brings. And these Hasidic Rebbe's spent their whole lives devoted to one thing, learning how to pray, learning how to talk to people, learning how to help people, how to cultivate their own inner life, like a Carmelite nun, for example, would do. And so how do we find people like that today? Or how do we offer that kind of heart in ourselves to other people? I guess that's the question we're asking here. Thank you. I've told that story many times, but I feel like I can, I've, I've heard it anew for the first time. So thank you. Chris, do you want to talk a little bit about the convergence that we're experiencing? Yeah, uh, what an inspirational story. And thank you so much for that. Um, I will say it is surreal this moment. Um, Michael, tonight, with all of the years that we've been working together, finally, uh, we have this privilege to have these guests on tonight, and it's so exciting. You know, I think when you talk about the convergence of the past few weeks or the past 16 months, you know, thinking about George Floyd, we just, you know, remembered the tragedy, uh, just the anniversary of his death, his public murder, his very public execution. And many people talk about George Floyd and I think it's important to acknowledge some of the people say, thank you, George Floyd, for giving your life. He did not, his life was taken. I think we have to think about the fact that there was a young girl, were it not for that young black girl who recorded it and posted it courageously. Yes. Who would know what has happened? And so we're talking about intergenerational impact. And then we think about the centennial of, of the violent destruction of a black community in Tulsa, where so many people had no clue that it happened. And the reality is this is not an uncommon thing. I think what grieves many African-Americans is the fact that a lot of people don't know that Tulsa 
mm -hmm. is not the only tragedy. Mm -hmm. There have been so many. If you want to think about it, Chicago, 1919, Detroit, 1943, New York, 1863, Washington, 1919, Philadelphia, 1985, East St. Louis, 1917, Springfield, 1908, Tulsa, 1921, Memphis, 1866, and Vicksburg, you have 1874, Colfax, 1873, St. Bernard Parish, 1868, New Orleans, 1866, Charleston, 2015, Atlanta, 1906, Wilmington, 1898. You get the point, Memphis, 1866. Many atrocities, many black massacres that many people had no clue actually existed. But Tulsa is bringing it to the forefront the same way that George Floyd's murder execution brought police brutality to the forefront and systemic racism. And then let's also think about the fact that the state of Israel has been at war with Hamas yet again and beyond the horror of war, the terror, the bloodshed, and the death of so many innocent folks. And unfortunately, I've witnessed as a friend to the Jewish people, Israel is being vilified and anti-Semitism unfortunately continues to spike in this country. And it's a shame, it's sad. It's one of the reasons I say we must do what we're doing tonight because while so many in your community don't understand what's happening in the black community, so many in my community don't understand what's happening to the Jewish people. And we always say we're better together. And then finally, the very thing that Dr. King actually gave his life for, voting rights is currently under attack in yes. this country. Who would have ever thought? And in ways that he or anyone of that generation could actually imagine. It's actually scary. And I'll tell you, we must re remain resilient because the reality is I never thought that I would see before my eyes many of the things that I read in the school books when I was a child. It makes me wonder what is our role now to make sure that what our predecessors, those great matriarchs and patriarchs from both of our communities did. Now it's our turn to pick up the mantle and run with the ball. And with that, a song that always give me encouragement out of the book of song. Lord, I will lift my eyes to the hills no wing my help it cometh from you your peace you give me in time of the storm, we say to him, you are the source of my strength. You are the strength of my life. And I lift my hands in total praise to, to you. Beautiful, thank you. When we think about the unity of our spirit, Jonathan, I gotta ask you and thank you so much for being with us tonight. As a biographer of Dr. King, you've had the opportunity to interview a number of people uh, in the film that really just blew me away. Uh, did you learn anything new in the film? And what is the message uh, that holds at this very moment? Um, thanks for that question. And thanks for the, the song. That's a tough act to follow, Pastor Harris. But um, yeah, the movie was, was, was really interesting to me. And I think the big takeaway that I had from it 
was, um, you know, Dr. King, and I did, I'm very lucky that I got to interview many of the people in the film, including a couple of people who passed away uh, since I interviewed them, C.T. Vivian and, and John Lewis. Um, but um, the thing that really struck me in this film was, you know, Dr. King talked about himself as the, the drum major for justice in, in his final sermon, actually. And the power of the drum major really struck me in this movie because here's a guy who um, can call, send a telegram, and, and within 24 hours, you know, a dozen rabbis are, are on the plane and heading down to St. Augustine, Florida. Um, he can put out the word and, and ministers uh, of all faiths flock from around the country to Selma. And, and how does that happen? How does one man um, become a drum major in a way that speaks to so many people? And part of King's real power was his ability to speak to so many different audiences. And that's really lost today. It's really becoming harder and harder in our fragmented society, but it wasn't easy back then either. Um, I mean, let's not um, joke, let's not make any bones about that. Um, Dr. King had the, the, the religion on his side for one thing, which I would love to hear from you about, um, all of three of you. Um, because if not for his being a man of God, I don't think he speaks to anywhere near the broad swath of America that he speaks to. He doesn't command the kind of respect uh, from people who have been reluctant to give respect to African Americans for so many years. Uh, but that's what really got me about the movie is um, his ability to not just speak to these audiences, but to rally them to action to have them drop what they were doing and come and join the fight. Just today, I was out in the suburbs with a Catholic priest who said he, he, he went down to Selma too because he saw what happened in Birmingham and he heard Dr. King's call, we need you in Selma. And he could, couldn't be on the sidelines anymore. He had to make a choice. And you know, his congregation wasn't happy about it, but he had to make a choice. And that's what King did. And, and that's what I hear you know, uh, Dr. Heschel saying about bearing the scars of the others in your congregation. That's what I hear, you know, Pastor Harris saying that, um, you know, we respond to what's hurting us in our community. And, and then he was able to turn that into action. Beautiful. Well, let, let, me, let me pick up on that, Jonathan, because actually uh, Rabbi Heschel and Dr. King met in Chicago. Yes. And the person who made the shidduch, as we would say, um, the person who made the match was actually my predecessor, Rabbi Seymour Cohen. And he was one of the, um, one, he was one of the organizers on the uh, Conference on Religion and Race, where the two met. And if you can imagine, and we sent out uh, to many of the people, the speech that um, Rabbi Heschel gave that night so one can only imagine the power of hearing Dr. King and Rabbi Heschel in that evening. It must have been just an unforgettable moment. But, you know, you, Susanna, you were about seven years old, I think, if I'm, my math is correct, at that time. Do you remember, do you have any memories of what was going on in your house and uh, the conversations be maybe between your mom and dad? about this? I do. I do have vivid memories, uh, in part because my father would come home in the evening and we would have dinner and then he would watch the seven o'clock news with Walter Cronkite. And we saw quite vividly what was happening in the South and the attacks. I, I remember vividly Birmingham in, you know, in particular. So it was very frightening. I think um, that's that's an element that can't be, uh, yeah, I, it diminished. That was it was a place of fear. So I do remember, and I remember my father going to Chicago. I remember uh, that he wasn't home and that he was in Chicago and that he was at a conference with Dr. King. And Dr. King was already a legend in our home, even for me. And uh, and after that, you know, just within a few months, my father and Dr. King were giving lectures together. Um, I, I think it's important also when I, I mean, I like what you said uh, earlier about the, the photograph of my father with Dr. King and how it should be uh, replaced with something from today, uh, which is fine. I, I also sometimes will tell people, 
don't take that photograph of as a sort of a sign of oh look how proud i am of this you know look what we did i hear you saying first of all it should be a challenge i'm not even sure people are worthy today of that photograph given as you just said before pastor harris had the voting rights that they were marching in selma to celebrate actually because it was going to pass that had been eviscerated by the Supreme Court and by state legislature. So what is there to be, in a sense, happy about? But I want to say that what was so significant is that it's because of the civil rights movement, which, first of all, I want to say is also an ecumenical movement. It's also a religious movement of profound importance. And it's profound importance because, I mean, just earlier today, I was writing a lecture that I have to give next week in Germany on, on Zoom. About, about Nazis and, and Protestant theologians who supported the Nazis. How Nazism was a religious movement. That's one kind of religious movement, fascism. This is a different and extraordinary religious movement, but it has to be appreciated as such. And you can't write a history of the civil rights movement without understanding the religious dimension. But I also have to say that the civil rights movement was the moment when America had the chance to become a democracy. What does it mean to be a democracy when a huge chunk of the population is forbidden from voting? It's not a democracy. So the civil rights movement and that march in Selma is important because it, it made America into what America is supposed to be, a democratic country. And so I think we have to acknowledge that also. And then I want to say as a Jew, you know, and I, as I said before, people, Jews will come up to me and say, oh, look what we did for them, which I find so appalling, so appalling for so many reasons, but I won't go into that. I just want to say, let's think, what did the civil rights movement do for American Jews? And it did a lot. It did so much. Charles Silberman has that book about, called A Certain People. He was a sociologist. And he describes kids going to public school in the 1950s, Jewish kids, with their Sunday school books wrapped in brown paper. They didn't want anybody to know they were Jewish. People were concealing their Jewishness. The Jews were getting nose jobs, and they were, they were hiding. And they were, and they were in their separate neighborhoods etc because first of all because of black studies we have jewish studies because of black nationalism we have suddenly an interest in israel on the part of american jews and there was an end to um that you know the council for american jews the anti-zionist uh movement ended nationalism was a good thing ethnicity was a good thing jews started wearing their hair loose etc uh, it, of course, also inspired the women's movement, the feminist movement, but it also it gave us a sense of pride in being Jewish. And I'll just tell you one thing. So my father gave a lecture together with Dr. King. You know, my father wrote books in Hebrew, Yiddish, German, and English. Amazing. And my father would go to lecture in Winnipeg, Canada. He could lecture in Yiddish because they knew Yiddish there, but not, at, not in America, not in the United States. But with Dr. King, he ended his speech which was about racism, it was about Soviet Jews, it was about Israel. And he ended it by speaking for three minutes in Yiddish. And I just want to say, I think that the presence of Dr. King at that lecture of my father's inspired him to speak in Yiddish. You understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Because he was speaking from the heart, you know, in a, in a passionate, different way. Powerful. I want to I want to pick up a little bit with what Jonathan was asking about the religious tradition because you wrote uh, Susanna a, a beautiful piece on Heschel King and the Hebrew prophetic tradition and I'm going to quote a little bit because you make the point for King and Heschel the prophets were also extraordinary human beings with passionate emotional lives, people who knew how to pray and who also created powerful symbolic moments. The force of King and uh, King's and Heschel's words also stem from their de deployment of emotive poetic language of the prophets. So in a sense, what you're saying is that it was their joint love of the prophetic tradition of the Hebrew Bible that was part of their bond. Uh, yes. And you know, that's also unique here in this country, because you don't find that uh, that emphasis on the prophetic tradition among German Lutheran theologians who are very sophisticated and know their Bible. Mm -mm. They don't, you don't find it there. You don't find it in France and England. No, you don't find pastors quoting from the prophets. 
even the translations in, in German, the German Amos, it, it sounds terrible. It doesn't have the rhetorical beauty, but in America, so look, my father said, if there's any hope for the future of Judaism in America, it lies with the black church because it's black church piety and theology. That's why we appreciate the prophets in this country, thanks to the black church. They've given that back to us as Jews. I also have to say, look, you know, in 1963 and even earlier, we were still as Jews reeling from the Holocaust and hiding ourselves. I think the civil rights movement inspired so many young Jews who had no particular religious background necessarily, but they inspired and gave them their souls back. It made them proud to be Jewish. Dr. King quoted from the Hebrew prophets. He could have been in, the, in all the major public speeches. I'm not talking about the sermons in church, but in the public speeches, there's Amos. That's verse from chapter five is the motto on the civil rights memorial in Montgomery, for example. He could have been quoting from Jesus and from the Beatitudes or the Sermon on the Mount. No, from Amos and Isaiah. What do you think that did for us as Jews? All of a sudden, first the Nazis killed six million, and now he's quoting from our Bible. What a transformation. What an incredible moment in Jewish history. and What a gift Dr. King gave us in that moment. In how Name a person who can't quote, let justice flow like yeah. a mighty stream and, and on and on it goes. And it was just part of their language. Your father wrote this remarkable book that was part of his PhD thesis that was ultimately published in the United States, which is, you know, the book to really appreciate the heart and soul of, of a prophet and that whole concept of anthropopathy that is so much a part of that book where God's pathos is being visited on the prophet. You can look at King and you can look at, at, at Rabbi, at, 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 at uh, uh, Dr. King, and you can look at Rabbi Heschel, and you can see that they are experiencing the prophetic moment. I mean, Chris, I, would, you, would you agree with that? Oh, absolutely. Let me first of all say um, my heart is just pounding and overjoyed. And, you know, Susanna, you're going to have to come to Bright Star and fine, we'll go ahead and make you an assistant pastor. Come on. <laughs> like, this, is, this is refreshing to hear. And and, and in so many ways, and absolutely, you know, Michael, you, you got to think about it. It reminds me uh, today, and it lets me know that we are doing the right thing. Let's be honest, 70% of preaching in the Black church is the Old Testament, right? And, you know, that's a little hard, and I'll be a little sensitive here. Um, it's a little hard, especially when you talk to many of our friends who will immediately say, oh, I don't mess with the New Testament. And I understand and respect it, but the black church really focuses on, right? And which is uh, on the Old Testament a lot. I just preached the last few Sundays from the Old Testament. They know that I'll be preaching from the Old Testament. And then we know how to bridge it and connect it to the New Testament. And we also know how to bridge the gap between the suffering of the Jewish people and black people. And that is the gospel for us. And it's pretty amazing. Uh, it's one of the things that I always tell my friends, the worst thing my Jewish friends can do is not build relationship with black people. Why? Because we love Jesus, right? We love the fact that he's connected to Israel and the Jewish community. And that is a wonderful bridge to be able to use to build relationship. And when we started to do our text studies together, right? We came in sitting at the table with the rabbis to say, we've been preaching the Old Testament. Teach us a little bit more about what we've been preaching. And that's what made our connections and our studies so powerful. And that started at Anshe Emmet for me. 10 years ago, I wasn't supposed to come to that meeting. But the first thing that you said, Michael, was we got to do more than just have platitudes, right? We don't just want to have this to be another preacher eating meeting. What we want is to do more. You said, let's go from words to work. And that's what shifted everything. And it's been 10 years of that studying, building, relating, communicating. 
and it has literally blown the minds. And now Susanna and Jonathan comes, it lets me know we got a lot more work to do. It's so exciting. Let me ask this, you know, you were talking about the civil rights movement, Susanna, as, you know, an ecumenical movement. Uh, I heard you quite a bit. Could you say a little bit more about that? And then I got a question for Jonathan. You know, I would just ask, what, what does it mean for us uh, as, as a Jew to meet with a Christian, what, what people like to call interfaith or interreligious? What, what, what do we want to accomplish? And I actually, this afternoon, I was reading some essays that people recently wrote about this. And I was a little annoyed because all of it, so much of it had to do with, well, Trinity, I don't accept Trinity. Maybe we can redefine Trinity and then we can accept it. I think, why? Why? You, the Christians believe in Trinity? Fine. Why does it have to be the same as my belief? What difference is that? Why can't I say this is different? I, I have a different tradition and that's great. But then the question really is why instead of looking for some kind of theological unity that's not going to happen, what, what is there something else? And what I would like to say is, first of all, when I meet someone of a different religion or study a different religion, I learn something about my own. Mm. I learn, I think differently, I reinterpret my own. So that's important. But the other thing I would say is, it's what am I looking for? I'm looking for inspiration. I want to be able to go to a religious service in a Catholic church and come away feeling inspired as a Jew in my Judaism. I, I want to be around people of faith, people who are praying devoutly and, and feel strengthened in myself. So I look for inspiration. And I would just say, finally, the last thing, that story that I told about the Abderav and his heart, in a sense, what Rabbi Siegel said before about my father's book on the prophets and my father talking about divine pathos. That's what my father means about God, mm. that God listens to us and responds to us. And that's the level that we should be thinking about and, and, and talking about when we speak about religion or interfaith, interreligious. It's not about doctrines, how you want to define the Trinity or not, whatever. That's not it. It's how do I become a better person? Oh. If we are the image of God, and that's the Abderav is the image of God in that story, in that moment. Michael, you know me, you know I'm falling in love, right? This is amazing. Yeah, no, I, definitely, I definitely hear that. I'm t it's, it's amazing. I got, I got to tell you in the movie, um, two riveting moments, Jonathan, that really floored me. Number one, the photo of uh, the black soldiers at the concentration camps uh, just floored me. And one of the speakers prior to literally made me cry because he had said that when African-Americans came there he had never seen a black person before and that black person was smiling at him and then the the 103rd engineer uh uh combat battalion one of the only black regiments sergeant william a scott took those photos and uh who knew their presence and uh, they were capturing these moments it was just mind-blowing but then the other one was uh one of the more powerful moments was the film was that portrayed Dr. King writing his letters from a Birmingham jail and the rabbinic response to it. So Jonathan, can you speak about Dr. King's state of mind from your perspective at that time? Yeah, that's a great question. And, um, you know, that was something that really upset Reverend King his whole life, really. Um, even as a child, you know, he grew up in the church, of course, and his father and his grandfather were Baptist preachers who combined theology with social activism. You couldn't have one without the other, in his view. Um, to believe in God was to believe that there could be no difference between the races, and not to work to change that was sacrilegious. So mm -hmm. when pastors, when ministers of any faith were on the sidelines and were saying, be patient, wait, you know, give us a time, society will is changing, it infuriated him. Because to him, that was that was a sacrilege. You could not, you you were not doing your duty if you were not fighting for change for the equality of the races. Because how could you worship God and believe that God would make one race superior to another? And how could you tell that race that's being deemed inferior to wait, be patient? And it infuriated him. And one of the things that really interested me about the movie is that 
they talked about the rabbi from Birmingham who um, insisted on, on going to the church after the bombing. But that rabbi was also one of the rabbis who infuriated Dr. King by writing the letter saying, wait, be patient. And the letter to Birmingham jail was written in response to this group of priests and one rabbi who had written a letter to the newspaper, published in the paper, as King was sitting in jail, he reads this article in the newspaper written by this group of clergymen saying, we urge Dr. King to be patient, give Birmingham time to come around. And that just lit a fire in him. He wrote this letter that became one of, you know, probably his most important writing. And it's, it fascinates me that the rabbi, um, maybe he was transformed. Maybe he was, he was, maybe he, his eyes were opened by Dr. King's letter because first comes the letter from Birmingham jail, then comes the bombing. And that same rabbi goes to church to worship and to, to pay homage to those, to those black children who were murdered in the, in the bombing of that church. So, um, that's, um, an outcome. That's a, a, um, a result of Dr. King's letter that I hadn't really thought about before. You know, the, the, there was a rabbinic response, which I wasn't actually familiar with until I saw the film and then looked it up. But it was a letter that was written by a group of rabbis in jail in St. Aug Augustine. And it was so powerful to me. And I, want, I, want to, I just want to read a little bit of it. And I'd like uh, Susanna to comment. We came to St. Augustine mainly because we could not stay away. We could not say no to Martin Luther King, whom we always, always respected and admired, and whose loyal friends we hope we shall be in the days to come. We could not pass by the opportunity to achieve a moral goal by moral means, a rare modern privilege, which has been the glory of the nonviolent struggle for civil rights. So this is, uh, it's, it's a very powerful piece, but I, I want, Susanna, if you would be kind enough to talk for a moment about the power of nonviolence as a moral force, as a religious force in that moment, amidst the lynchings that were going on, amidst the Bill Connors, amidst the Governor Wallace's, what, what went into nonviolent struggle because it wasn't just not fighting back was it no no and i would say you know the non non training and nonviolence was months and months and it wasn't just about someone hits me i don't hit back it was about rethinking how you are as a person how you relate to other people the change of the heart and the spirit it was a transformation of the self that was required it was demanded of the instructors and so I have to say, yeah, and whenever I meet somebody from the civil rights movement who knew my father, they hug me and they express gratitude. And I think after 60 years, they still express gratitude. That's extraordinary. And that's also part of what it was to be trained in nonviolence, to become a different kind of person, a person of gratitude. It's a different way of being in the world. I, I, I you know, um, Rabbi Israel Dresner, it was called Cy Dresner uh, from New Jersey. And he used to say that he was the most frequently imprisoned rabbi in America. He was in St. Augustine and I'm sure he had a hand in that letter. He was a very outgoing and energetic person. But uh, I think it's also after all about not wanting to be a bystander. Right. Well, you know, but, but did you also notice he said I, we, we couldn't not do this. Right. And that's also something is that some things I, 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 I can't cannot possibly eat pork. I can't. The question is, there are religious commandments that have to do with prayer and, and food and all kinds of things like that. There isn't as much emphasis on my religious obligation to help another person the commandments that have to do with other human beings. And that's also the transformation. And I also say thanks to the civil rights movement, that that becomes a religious obligation and was felt that way. You know, I, 
I want to I want to read on in the letter because I want to bring out this point that you're making a little bit more because I also think it has to do with the aftermath of the Shoah. Yes. Because and here's what they write. We came because we could not stand quietly by our brother's blood. We had done that too many times before. We have been vocal in our exhortation of others, but the idleness of our hands too often revealed an inner silence, silence at a time when silence has become the unpardonable sin of our time. We came in the hope that the God of all of us would accept our small involvement as partial atonement for the many things we wish we had done before and often. This is like Yom Kippur for them. And they're expressing it. And I have to believe that in 1963, as you were mentioning earlier, the Holocaust is also becoming part of the consciousness of the Jewish people or their writing. It's coming out of its big, well, Eichmann's trial was in 61. So there, it's, it's becoming something that our Jews are talking about, but they're also looking at what more they could have done in that time. And I don't think, I think that that's part of this. I wonder if you agree. Absolutely. I absolutely agree. It's such a, yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. yeah. Um such a powerful thing but yet at the same time i think they're also talking about their own sins of overlooking the african-american community there's that great story chilling story but powerful where a jewish couple goes to florida and they're driving in a taxi cab the driver's black and they start noticing all of these signs no Jews, no dogs, no Jews, no dogs. And they're talking to themselves about it. And they finally asked the driver, he said, are we going to see more of these? And the driver then said to them, notice they don't even bother saying Negroes. Mm -hmm. That kind of invisibility, that kind of acceptance of abject racism was also, I think, part of this rabbinic letter. And when you, th when you think about it, Michael, the, you know, uh, how much the world has changed and how little the world has changed at the same time. Just consider James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, Michael Schwerner in Mississippi in 1964 for the prime of working for voters' rights. Susanna, I just gotta ask, can, you know, I'd love to know your thoughts and your feelings about what's going on in the country now. Happily, but I, I would just want to say to to muddy the waters a little bit. Please. Uh, <laughs> uh, I still have to keep in mind when I when I I'm, I have I think it's very important for us to remember the civil rights era for all the reasons that I said earlier. Uh, but I also want to say that when Jews from Germany began to come to the United States in the mid-19th century and began to build synagogues, I remember in Charleston, South Carolina and elsewhere, they would dedicate a synagogue and someone would give a speech. And the South Carolina, when his speech was about being liberated from Europe and all the anti-Semitism of Europe and coming to this free country. In Charleston, South Carolina, and this was before the Civil War, was in the 1850s, when Charleston was a slave trading city, and they're talking about the great freedom of America. So obviously they have, they have blinders and they're also identifying themselves as white. Now, I think it's important for us to recognize that we're talking here about also about a slave economy. So even those who had nothing to do with slavery in a personal way benefited from the slave economy. Look at our universities. How did we get all of these incredible universities? Who gave the money for this? And as my, my former colleague, Craig Wilder, wrote in his book, Ebony and Ivy, the universities were built out of the, the money, the wealth that was created by the slave economy. I'd like to know about the churches and the synagogues that were built. Huge, beautiful. I don't know. Who gave the money? Where did they get that money? The people who donated for this. So let's keep that in mind as well. And I have to say that with all of the wonderful people, Jews involved in the civil rights movement, 
even when you talk about <clears throat> the three in Mississippi who were murdered, how did they find their bodies? They found their bodies because there were two white Jews in that threesome. And in the course of, and so the FBI got involved, the federal government, there hadn't been two white people. It wouldn't have happened. And while they were dredging the swamps, they found lots and lots of black men, dead bodies that had also been murdered and dumped in swamps. So there is, Jews have benefited after the Second World War, as Karen Brodkin shows in her book, because Jews as white people not only could benefit from the GI Bill and the various housing allotments that were provided by the federal government, they could actually buy a house in a suburb, whereas Blacks were not allowed to buy in that suburb and couldn't make use of that kind of funding and housing and so on. So let's keep in mind that Jews benefited a lot from having white skin. Most Jews, not all Jews, have white skin, but yeah, there were also Jews. And, and, and while we're muddying the waters, um, <laughs> everybody went down to Selma and Birmingham and St. Augustine. Um, they came back north and what was happening, the suburbs were turning white because of white flight from the cities. Schools were, were resegregating and that often got overlooked. And look what happened when Dr. King came to Chicago in 1966. Cicero. He was right. He was he was he, he, he faced kind of racism that shocked him even by Southern standards. So, um, you know, sometimes it was easy to beat up on the South uh, because the, the racism was so blatant. But the the insidious, more subtle racism in the North got a pass. And that's something that we're still reckoning with. I got to tell you, Michael, as a black man, you know, I think this is the first time I ever said that I'm going to invite these folks to come and talk during Black History Month. <laughs> it, it, I appreciate hearing um, your view, and it is nice to hear what we know it, from a person who does not have Black skin. Yeah. And I just want to take a point of personal privilege to say thank you, uh, because the truth is often whitewashed. And I just cannot thank you guys enough. I'm doing my best not to get emotional, but it is so refreshing. And I just want to say thank you. Please keep telling truth. Amazing. Yeah. Well, let me, let me, I, I, and I, I thank, I thank everyone for this conversation, but I want to, I want to go back to the, this conversation about Goodman and Schwerner, because one of the reasons they were murdered, I think, as I, at least I want to. I want to posit, is because they had abused their whiteness. They had betrayed their whiteness in the eyes of their murderers by standing with the African American community. They were killed for that reason, right? They were, in other words, they were no longer when when they were killed. They were no longer seen as white. And I want to just take this one step further because that same issue of Jews being no longer being seen as being white in this society was very much on the minds of those chanting in Charlottesville, the Jews will not replace us. So what was, what was the issue for them? The fact that Jew, because Jews are, you know, because Jews are involved and because of course, people of color could never move their cause forward without help, the Jews are, you know, the, they're, they're the puppeteers and they are managing this entire thing. And so again, you know, in, in the eyes of many, well, whereas Jews might've seen themselves as white, the larger society often didn't. And I think that that's, a, that, that, that's that, that just needs to be factored in somewhere. Yes and no, yes and no. In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Uh, yeah, but um, still, uh, l let me give another example of something we should be thinking about. What does it mean to live in a racist society and celebrate Passover? What does that mean? What does it mean to celebrate Passover if you are a Black Jew? What does is, what is liberation from slavery mean? to you and that Passover story is always told you know, with commentaries and metaphor, you should feel it, the, the, the exodus from Egypt as if you yourself were brought out of Egypt. Can you feel that way if you 
as a white person in America are living in a society where police can murder a black person with impunity on the streets of this country? What, what, and, and just to, to look at it historically for a moment, there's a great article by extraordinary historian in Toronto, Natalie C. Davis, where she found a Passover Haggadah at the University of Toronto rare book collection that belonged to a family of Jewish slave owners who had a plantation in Suriname. And she wrote about it. You know, there's a Hebrew prayer for purchasing a slave, but there's no Hebrew prayer, by the way, for a woman giving birth to a baby, by the way. Uh, that's another. But what does it mean for a family that owns slaves to sit down at the table on Passover? Maybe we need to think about that too. Jews are not only those who have been enslaved, but they've also been people who have owned slaves. And that's a part of our history that we sometimes don't want to look at, but we should. And that includes not just Suriname, by the way, but also in, in, uh, in the Middle East, in the Middle Ages, uh, in the Arab Middle East, in the Mediterranean Basin, and so on. So I think it's America important too. also- there were, there were Jewish slave owners in America. Yeah. When my father started his speech on religion and race, and he talked about the first summit on religion and race, the main participants were Pharaoh and Moses. And he was telling also Jews, in this situation, you're Pharaoh. Don't just think of yourselves as Moses, as the enslaved. Jews can also understand we are also Pharaoh, and that's important. And in this moment, in the United States, all the more so. I, I, I must say, Michael, I, I just, um, I'm, I'm overwhelmed. And, and this is a personal moment for me, um, for all of my Jewish friends. And since I'm an honorary member at Anshe Yamit, I gotta tell you, Susanna and Jonathan, again, thank you. Uh, it's one of the reasons why this history that you are sharing boldly and undeniably and is documented historically is one of the reasons I get beat up a lot in my community for standing with the Jewish community. It is one of the reasons why doing the work that I do, singing the Hatikvah and building bridges across the country between African-American and Jewish people and going on college campuses, teaching them how to combat BDS. It's one of the reasons that I get beat up a lot for it, but I remain committed to it because of what I saw your father and Dr. King do and people like Julius Rosenwald and Booker T. Washington and so many others and having an ally like Michael being courageous enough to say, hey, let's do the work and tackle this and let's not take credit for the last generation. But I cannot express enough how heartwarming tonight it is to hear someone and individuals speak truth that that is a part of the history. And it, let, it gives me hope that as we be courageous enough to tackle these tough conversations and be adult about it, I think we can heal a lot of the wounds that are still there and potentially strengthen the bridge that keeps us from being divided. So thank you. I, I appreciate the conversation, but I feel compelled also to say that the word for the Passover um, uh, book that we use at a Seder is Haggadah, right? It's not Hasipur, it's not the story, it's the telling, meaning that it's a dynamic telling of the story that in every generation we tell this story again and again and again. And yes, I do think that it is important to be honest and thoughtful about how uh, about Jewish history. The fact that Maimonides himself talks about how to manage slaves, right? And one of our most venerated uh, teachers. And we we have we need to acknowledge we need to name it we need to also look at the historical um the the historical context as well but i but i'm unwilling to but but at the same time 
I think we have to balance this a bit and say, look, you know, who who were who were the who were the founders of the NAACP? Where was the Jewish community? Why was it that the Jewish community was so focused? Why was it that that so many African Americans wanted to wear kippot yarmulkes during the marches because they called them freedom caps because so many Jews were out there? That's also the power of the story, is it not? I think we have to kind of balance this a bit. Yes, absolutely, and we need allies. And we need to be inspired and we need to be understood and affirmed and we need to have other people tell our story for us so we can hear that we have a resonance in their hearts and minds absolutely and we need to do it in a good way absolutely i i think that what happened in the civil rights movement as i said before is extremely important and and i'm thrilled that the the movement was an ecumenical movement that brought jews in I thought it did so much for us, all of us, and we still draw inspiration from it. And it's a pity that today, what do we have? We have people going off into their own little communities and, and separate and, and not forging alliances. And I think that's tragic and we need to change that. We have all these authoritarian dictators running around the world. Two thirds of the world lives under an illiberal authoritarian dictator. Why? What is that about? And look at the poor people. It must be millions of people in this world, on this earth, every day being tortured in prisons. Here too, in this country, that's another topic we can address. But we, we, we passionately, desperately need to save ourselves. And we need allies to do that. And we need to be inspired. And we need our hearts held by one another. So I agree with you, Rabbi Siegel. I appreciate that. And I appreciate this conversation. And what we what we were what we've been talking about and what the film portrays so beautifully is the bridge that was created, the bridge that people walked across. And the film also acknowledged that that bridge has um, is in need of repair. Mm. And there has been a period of time when Jews and people of color were not crossing that bridge. I think so much of the work that Chris and I have been working to do is really to reestablish that bridge. But let's also acknowledge that the time in which we're living is really um, putting that bridge at risk. The issues um, that are surrounding Israel and how Israel is being portrayed, and again, no one is suggesting that Israel is above criticism or anything like that. And anyone who knows me or has heard me knows that. But at the same time, you know, the intersectionality that we are facing right now is a true challenge for us. And it concerns, it should concern all of us greatly as to how to go forward. But I, I will say that what and I'm speaking now to, to the Jews that are listening to this conversation. My, my advice is to lean in. My advice is to find ways to continue the conversation. My, my thinking is that the hard conversations need to be had so that we can go forward together. I think it's vital for us. I think it's vital for the black community. I think it's vital for this country that this alliance, this partnership, this bridge be, um, be secured, honestly, thoughtfully, openly, but again, embracing action, and I'll, again, I'll quote your father, leaps of faith are great, but what we need here are leaps of action. And um, that, to me at least, is where the future lies. I agree with you 100%, and I think, uh, I think one of the things that we have done and I encourage everybody to do is model your expectations of the next generation, right? Where is the work? What inspires us are the words, but what should continue to ignite us is the work. And that's gonna be so very important. What can we do? And don't forget Rabbi, it was your words at that first meeting. You said, what more can we do? Now, what more can we say? Mm -hmm. What more can we do? And we're constantly asking people to find what you will do to bridge the gap between 
the African-American and Jewish community. Find the work and be a part of it. Thank you. Um, I wanna give uh, Jonathan and Susanna the last words tonight and then we'll wrap the program up. Jonathan? Well, I was just struck by um, what Pastor Harris said it connected to what um, Susanna said in the very beginning when she said there was this moment in the 60s when it seemed like we were going to deliver on the promise of democracy and it feels like we failed like we like we dropped the ball um, I would argue that uh, the ball was knocked out of our hands by um, forces that did not want or were not ready to see this happen yet but what I would like to end by saying is that it was not um, it, it can happen again. It, it'd be, it would be foolish to think over the grand scope of history that such a thing could only happen once. Um, it can happen again. And the forces that accumulate to make something like this happen are happening now and we just don't recognize them. Uh, and we just need to be ready to build that movement because what was that's what they called it before that was the civil rights movement with a capital C and a capital R and a capital M. It was just the movement with a capital M. And that meant bring together coalitions, bringing together individuals from the grassroots to the organizations, to the businesses and moving together toward a common goal. And that can and, and will happen again. Thank you, Jonathan. Susanna? Yeah, I feel, I feel also, that I feel the same way. Uh, that is, it takes a long time to change the society and change human beings. And it sometimes happens in fits and starts. Sometimes it's happens slowly. But I guess we also need some compassion for one another. We are just human beings and it's hard for us. And we, we are struggling and we have our ups and downs. But I do think that ultimately, Dr. King said, justice will prevail. I do believe that. I, I, I just want to say that also one, one you know, one thing about Israel, today we should be celebrating because something extraordinary has happened. The government is changing and it's changing in a coalition of the political spectrum from left to right coming together, including for the first time in the government coalition, Palestinian representative from a Palestine, from an Arab party in the government, first time, that's great. Who would have thought it two weeks ago? I was so mad. And now this. And you know, it's remarkable how things can happen that way. Something awful one moment, then something great. I just want to tell you that this spring uh, quarter at Dartmouth that just ended this week, I taught, I taught a seminar with a colleague of mine, Tarek El Aris, who's chair of the Middle Eastern Studies program. And we taught a course called The Arab, the Jew, and Constructions of Modernity. And we talked about some of the similarities. Jews have Jewish enlightenment, the Haskalah, and the Arabs have the Arab Renaissance called the Nahda that happened at the same time, concerned with the same issues. Some of the same problems also dealing with Europe, dealing with the Christian West, trying to figure out what, what identity means and how to forge an identity, et cetera. And it was a marvelous class with great students and a great discussion and inspiring to everyone. So I think these coalitions are actually popping up here and there. We should take hope from that, even though we have a lot to be pessimistic about. My father said once in an interview, I'm an optimist despite my better judgment. <laughs> so in times of despair, which you know does come, although in Judaism, it's a sin to be despairing, actually. Despair is a sin. One should have some hope and recognize we're frail, we're only human, we're making small steps, but we are moving. I believe we are moving in the right direction. So it's been great to be with you. I Thank wish you. I were in Chicago with you right now. Chicago, how do you say it in Chicago with that accent, Chicago? Okay. <laughs> Jonathan can answer that question, but uh, I, I wanna thank everybody. I want to, um, I think this has just been a tremendous conversation and one that I want to continue. And so, Susanna, when you come to Chicago, I hope we'll be able to arrange another conversation or do it on Zoom, but this is an important one. And I want to just end um, our conversation tonight. Uh, if, unless, Pastor Harris, you have something you want to say? No. Let me, let me take I, 
Okay. I'm overjoyed. I will give you the last word for a change. So, much. <laughs> so when Jews recite blessings and we recite a hundred blessings a day and we have blessings for everything under the sun and as it reminded us things that we need to have blessings for that we should create in our day. Um, maybe an opportunity for consciousness, but a blessing can also be a call to action. And one blessing that we recite every morning is, and that the letter that was written by those rabbis ended with, is Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Matir Asurim. Praise to you, Lord our God, ruler of the universe, who frees the captives. That has to be a call to us, that anyone who feels oppressed needs to hear the voice of the prophets calling out to them relentlessly, without patience, to ensure that every person can walk free. And then we will create the de democratic society that we all deserve and most certainly our children and grandchildren deserve. Thank you everyone for being with us tonight. Thank you all. Great to be with all of you. Thank you so much. Bye -bye. Better together. Be well. Better Thank together. you so much. Let's Thank meet you. again soon. Right. Good night, everyone. Good night. Good night. All right.